Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, just as he chose in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and thought, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a planless for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also in obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of his promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. When someone sneezes in public, I've got into the habit of saying, bless you. And I must admit, I get a few funny looks. That saying of bless you goes right back to the plague where the early symptoms were coughing and sneezing. So saying bless you was thought to be a way of warding off the plague. How successful it was, I'm not too sure. This passage from Paul's letter to the Ephesians is all about bless you. It's packed full of praise. It's packed full of thanksgiving. It's about bless you God. But blessing has two meanings, because not only is it an act of thanksgiving, but it's also about bestowing a gift on someone. And you can see both of these ideas here in this passage. God is to be blessed for God's blessing. We bless God, if you like, for all the blessings that God gives us. Because, as Paul says in verse 4, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. God chose us. Wow! God has always intended to do what God is doing now. God chose us. God has a meaning. God, God has a purpose for us. And what's more, it's always been God's will to do what God wants. We mean that much to God. Lord, we bless you. Paul goes on to list God's grace and the different outpourings of God's blessing. There's redemption and forgiveness. There's wisdom and there's insight. All this results in faith. And our response is to live for the praise of God's glory, as Paul puts it in verse 12. But living to praise God is a really radical message for today because it runs against the way of the world. I love to watch a family of different generations going out for a meal, especially when it comes to paying the bill. And there's often an argument about who's going to pay. I'll pay. No, no, I'll pay. But you paid last time. I'll pay now. And on it goes. There's that idea that if we are in someone's debt, it's not a good thing. We must try and pay back that debt as quickly as possible. But with God's mercy, with God's grace, with God's love, with God's forgiveness, that debt can never, ever be repaid. Jesus talks about this in Matthew's Gospel when he tells the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew chapter 18, where 
a servant has a debt so great, so massive, that it's impossible to be repaid. But the king or God forgives that debt. And we praise and give thanks to God for cancelling the debt of our sin, for our failings. We worship God for that gift of abundant grace, that everlasting mercy, that precious, unquenchable divine love. And to a logical way of thinking, that is no response at all. But God isn't about logic. God, logic is completely overshadowed by God's desire to be that God of blessing. So we are blessed and we praise God for that blessing. And that is fundamental right to the very core of our existence as God's creatures. We are vessels, if you like, of God's blessing. But we're not just vessels, we're channels too, because God's blessing is to be shared. It's there to be given out. In other words, we are blessed so we can be a blessing to others. And we become obstacles to God when we hoard and protect that blessing for our own private use. Let me tell you a story. Two people met one day to talk about God's blessing. Each one of them had their own blessing, which was very special and precious to them. And after talking a bit about it, they agreed to show each other their own blessing. And the first person put their box on the table. They opened the box, took out the object, which was wrapped in tissue paper and cotton wool. And they slowly and carefully unwrapped it. And there, shining and in perfect condition, was the most beautiful blessing you ever did see. It was shiny. It was bright. It was beautiful. And that person said, you're actually very, very fortunate to see this because I don't, I don't, I daren't share this with any old one, they said. And the second person, they looked downcast and ashamed and they rummaged around in their bag and stuffed in a corner, wrapped in some tatty newspaper was their blessing. And with embarrassment, they opened the newspaper and there was the blessing. It was dirty, it was chipped, it was all out of shape. I'm sorry, they said. I'm sorry that it looks so awful. I'm forever getting out my blessing and using it. I'm showing it to people or just looking at it for myself because I find it so beautiful, so amazing, even if it is in such an awful shape now. I wonder, what does your blessing look like? What sort of blessing would you like to have? That beautiful, pristine one? or that one that is all tatty and dirty and chipped, having people's dirty hands and fingerprints on it because it has been held and shared with so many. People sometimes talk about things being the world's best kept secret and they do it with a sense of pride. But if we describe God's love as the best kept secret, then I think that is an utter disgrace. God's love, God's blessing should be and must be the world's worst kept secret. Not to be stored up, 
but to be shared, to be given away. Paul says in that passage that we've heard, God has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. The mystery of salvation should be a mystery to us because we can't understand it. But it shouldn't be a mystery to others who know nothing about it. It should be an open secret. Or better still, no secret at all. God's blessing is not to be stored up. God's blessing was given to us to be shared. So we bless God and God says, I bless you and may we bless one another. Holy God, we thank you for your blessing and all the different ways you bless us every single day. Help us to share your blessing and bless those who we meet today and every day. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord look on you with kindness and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>